to order. I'm Tim Colton, representing the Davis Center uh, for Russian and Eurasian Studies. And it's really a great pleasure to welcome uh, Japanese colleagues and friends uh, back uh, to our university and our center. Uh, we have actually had a conversation going with uh, Japanese specialists on Russia and, and its neighborhood for many years now. I don't know David who might remember better, but it's certainly um, the better part of 20 years, it seems to me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and at one point we had a, a, a really neat organized exchange, which involved us and you, the, the Slavic Research Center uh, in Sapporo, but also Oxford, right? St. Anthony's Oxford, wasn't right. it? The, the, the St. Anthony's was involved and George Washington for the yeah. traditional political scientists who right. wanted to be in Washington. Right. And that was on, only one component of what we did. We, we've done quite a few other things, and a number of us have spent time, a uh, very enjoyable time, uh, in Japan. Uh, in my case, uh, relatively short giving talks, uh, but we've had a couple of colleagues actually spend an extended period there. Didn't Jagosh out here spend? Jagosh uh, Jag 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 spent a, a term. Spent, yeah, I think he spent three months with us. Yeah, yeah. And I think Sergei is coming to come join us short. I, I I applied. I'm just waiting. For oh wow! <laughs> well, we'll just. Be... Oh, no, but... I, I'm here to lobby. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, when David uh, let me know that let us know that uh, this uh, small group would be uh, in the country for uh, the ACs meeting in Chicago. Uh, he, su he suggested, why don't we stop by in Boston and tell a few things about what we're doing nowadays. And of course, we're very happy to um, accept that proposal, which is what led to this uh, rather short, uh, uh, but hopefully very uh, intriguing panel today. So what we're going to hear from, uh, what we're going to hear about is three, sl three slices of a rather specialized kind that I think I take as a sample of what uh, uh, Japanese uh, specialists are, are working on these days, and um, they're not necessarily linked with one another in any particular linear way. That's not the idea here, but just to hear uh, uh, three uh, three pieces, uh, uh, a little sample. And then I did challenge David in some correspondence there to go to find a way as we proceed towards our uh, 5.30 uh, deadline to, to see what, if anything, is Eastern or Japanese about this? Is there is there a, a particular angle or slant on things that comes from being located where Japan is located with its own particular history, of course, of interaction with the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union? Or is this uh, kind of what you might get from uh, you know highly qualified specialists sitting in uh, London or Cambridge, Massachusetts? So I'm not sure we can give an authoritative answer, but it would be fun to hear you know, some ideas from Japanese colleagues. So let me uh, uh, very briefly introduce uh, our cast of characters. Uh, we're gonna hear first from Professor Tabata Shinichiro, uh, who, is going to, uh, who is going to talk about how the sanctions are destroying the Russian economy. All right, uh, so that's uh, now, uh, uh, Professor Tabata is um, an, an economist. He does comparative economic work and has a particular interest in the Russian economy. And then we'll hear from Pro Professor Naganawa Norihiro, who is seated on my other side. Um, and he is going to talk, I think I have this right. Yes, I do. Um, about something, I, I must admit, uh, uh, I never, really appreciate that this topic existed, but we're, so this is going to be really new, I think, for most <laughs> of us. Uh, the long-term roots of contemporary ties between Russia and Saudi Arabia going back to the Soviet period. Um, and so that's going to be really informative. And, and then Professor Wolf, David Wolf, uh, is going to talk um, about uh, how China figures in contemporary uh, Russian calculations. He's done a textual analysis of the latest Valdai transcript looking for pearls from <laughs> President uh, Putin, uh, for President Putin, actually. Pearls from the swan. All right, so let's let's start then with Professor uh, Tabata. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, you uh, for giving us this opportunity to uh, make presentation uh, in this uh, distinguished center. Thank you, it's our pleasure. So, so next slide, please. So uh, I'd like to talk about the uh, present situation concerning sanctions imposed on the Russian economy. 
Uh, first, uh, I look at Russia's uh, uh, economic situation. And then I will touch upon the performance of Japan's uh, trade with Russia uh, to illustrate that Japan's approach to Russia or economic sanctions against Russia is basically in line with uh, European countries and the United States. So far, uh, I have been engaged in, in empirical studies on the Russian economy. Uh, today's presentation will be also based on statistical analysis. Next. Uh, in this chart, the blue bar showed the current account surplus. Uh, its increase began in the third quarter of last year, caused by the increase in export, exporting shown red line. Uh, uh, due to a price increase. Exports peaked in the uh, fourth quarter. In the first quarter of this year, the increase in imports, a uh, decrease in imports began. Uh, that is a green line uh, caused by the embargo by the West. It should be noted that in terms of quarterly amount of current account surplus, the first and the second quarter of this year, hit the record, uh, more than 70, 70 billion dollars. Next. Uh, in terms of annual amount, its record was made in last year, uh, more than 120 billion dollars. As for this year, uh, this figure is only for January, September, but it was already over 200 billion dollars. We, uh, we can anticipate uh, this year uh, to be a new record. Uh, what can we learn uh, from this extraordinary large increase in current account surpluses of Russia? Uh, there are several merits of this increase. Oh, next. Uh, first, the uh, Russian authorities were able to prevent the depreciation of the ruble after its sharp crash in March. Next. The second merit is the increase in international reserves, uh, blue, line, blue line in this figure. They peaked at the beginning of this year. Uh, the third merit is that since current account surplus is statistically equal to net savings, uh, in the Russian case, they have been accumulated by the government sector. As a result, uh, national welfare fund has increased uh, rapidly, uh, shown by red line. This fund has been used to make up the federal budget deficit. Next. Uh, this figure shows the monthly performance of the federal budget of Russia. Revenues, red and blue bar, uh, increased in March and April, but began to decrease after that. Uh, red bar Red bar shows oil and gas, oil and gas revenues in federal budget revenues. It is uh, apparent, apparent that the decreases in federal budget revenues since May were mainly caused by those in oil and gas revenues. Uh, expenditures, as shown by Green Line, uh, began to surpass revenues since June, implying uh, deficits of the federal budget. Next slide. Uh, although uh, Russia ceased to publish data on exports of oil and gas, uh, they continue to publish data on their production. Uh, this data more, more or less suggests the trend of exports of these fuels. Uh, production, production of crude oil, blue line, uh, and petroleum products, uh, red line, uh, did not decrease uh, significantly in this year. Uh, production of LNG, uh, purple line, increased largely. Uh, on the contrary, production of natural gas, uh, green line, decreased uh, significantly. Uh, as, the, as the above argument indicates, uh, as long as oil and gas exports from Russia continues, uh, Russia can accumulate current account surpluses and earn state budget revenues. Uh, in this connection, I made a simple and preliminary simulation uh, calculating uh, what will be the effect of complete stop of imports of oil and gas 
uh, by the waist. Next. Uh, this table shows the structure of oil and gas exports from Russia uh, by countries in 2021. Uh, you see crude oil, petroleum products, natural gas, and the total, uh, it's a total, uh, uh, almost 70% of oil and gas uh, was uh, exported to the West. Next slide. Uh, this is a estimate uh, for 2027, uh, which is calculated by assuming that the West stops the imports of oil and gas from Russia, and that uh, Northwest, uh, Northwest, Northwest uh, uh, increases those by uh, so, uh, imports of oil and gas by 30% in comparison with 2021. Next slide. Oh. Uh, this uh, table shows the result of the simulation. I assume that domestic consumption of oil and gas will not change in this period, and non oil and gas revenues also will not change. Then, uh, total volume of Russia's oil and gas exports fell by 58% uh, by 2027 in comparison with 2021. Oil and gas revenues are estimated to decrease uh, 41 percent, uh, which will cause decrease in federal budget revenues by 15 percent. But this assumption uh, that there uh, there will be no changes in domestic consumption of oil and gas and uh, no change in non-oil and gas revenues are uh, unrealistic. There will be there will be significant decreases in them due to the stagnation of the economy. Therefore, I think uh, that my calculation may, may somewhat underestimate the effect of a complete stop of imports by the West. Next slide. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to talk about what Japan is doing in relation to the economic sanctions against Russia. Uh, this chart shows Japan's trade with Russia. Japan's imports are red line, Increased in the in the last quarter of last year, uh, and remained large in the first quarter of this year. Then, from March uh, of this year, they began to decrease. Uh, with respect to Japan's exports to Russia, uh, blue line, uh, they considerably decreased in March, uh, right after Russia's invasion in Ukraine. Next slide. Uh, this chart shows detail on Japan's exports to Russia. Uh, automobiles have been one of the most important goods exported to Russia from Japan. Blue bar shows new cars, and the red bar shows uh, used car exports. Uh, new car exports decreased considerably in April and disappeared after May. New cars are exported by Japanese major automobile companies. They withdrew from Russia and completely stopped trading and business with Russia. On the contrary, used car exports continued and increased significantly after June. Now, uh, used cars accounted for, accounted for more than half of Japan's exports to Russia. Used cars are exported by medium and small companies. They seem to continue and expand their business with Russia. The Japanese government only banned the exports of vehicles valued at $40,000 or more. Uh, that is a lux luxury car. So next. Uh, this is a detail of Japan's imports from Russia. Most of them are accounted for by fuels such as coal, blue, uh, blue bar, uh, crude oil, uh, red bar, and LNG, uh, green bar. Uh, from March, they began to decrease, uh, particularly crude oil imports declined considerably from May. Uh, coal imports declined in September. Uh, Prime Minister of Japan, Kishida, announced in April and May that Japan would stop imports of coal and crude oil from Russia. But uh, imports of LNG have not decreased yet. The Japanese government has, in, has indicated its intention 
to maintain the, uh, maintain the interests of Japanese companies in Sahara. Uh, next. So the, the conclusion of this uh, presentation are very simple. Uh, since the Russian economy heavily depends on oil and gas exports, if they continue, Russia can survive and uh, prosper. If not, uh, there will be great damage to the Russian economy. I anticipate that uh, when the West will cut imports uh, of oil and gas from Russia, as they declare, then the damage to the Russian economy would be much greater, much larger. I think that there is still ample room for reducing oil and gas imports from Russia. Thank you so much. Okay, very good, thank you. So uh, maybe I'll just ask one question. Yes. And because uh, these topics are so different from one another, and then we'll go into more general discussion. So, I had the impression that economists were, on the whole, the message was that what was most damaging to Russia since all this began was curtailment of Russian imports. So, the goods that, that are needed in industry, including in weapons production and all the rest of it, and that. Uh, well, as you showed, uh, in certain regards, uh, exports um, soared in um, dollar terms. Um, but your emphasis seemed more on the other side of the equation. No, uh, only I uh, pay uh, most of today's uh, presentation, I uh, pay more attention to the uh, revenues of a federal budget. Yeah. If, uh, if, the, uh, if we consider the damage to the Russian economy, I think the uh, embargo of high technology machinery and equ equipment, mm -hmm. uh, like semiconductor or yes. something like that, is, um, I think uh, that caused more critical or serious damage to the Russian economy. Uh, so if uh, we uh, continue this embargo of high, tech, high, tech, high technology equipment, probably uh, Russian economy will be degraded. degraded. Degraded, or the Russian economy will become more uh, primitive in the sense that the, uh, their products are one or two generations behind those of the West, uh, as was the case of the Soviet people. So I think uh, that uh, embargo of uh, exports to the Russia is, so, yeah. in a sense, more critical. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that seems to have um, softened the blows on the export side is that India and China have increased their uh, import, uh, imports of uh, their purchases of uh, Russian oil and gas. Uh, is it uh, conceivable that uh, these two countries, or maybe just China, could to some extent substitute for the blockaded goods from the West and Japan? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the I think uh, oil, the situation of oil and gas is uh, completely different. So China and India maybe uh, can substitute some part of uh, uh, substitute uh, some other, uh, some uh, uh, part of uh, uh, Western, Western import of oil. Right. But the, concerning the gas, it is impossible because uh, construction of a new pipeline and uh, air energy facility will take a uh, much uh, longer time, years. So five or 10 years. So I, I, I don't think uh, gas is a, uh, imports of gas is in, uh, impossible. But what about the technology? Um, some Russians seem to think that they can get stuff from China that will make up for the difference. So but uh, as far as I know, maybe, uh, they do, we talk about it uh, later, but uh, as far as I know, the uh, Chinese exports to Russia uh, has not uh, increased, uh, increased as we uh, anticipated, uh, because a Chinese company also afraid of- uh, Secondary yeah, China. Yeah. So the, I, I, I don't think they, they will uh, increase their uh, exports of high technology uh, equipment to us, I was Okay, very good. Does anybody have a, a we, we could manage a question here. If um, I'm failing that, we'll just move on to our second speaker. Is that okay? All right, so thank you very much. Yeah. That was very well done. Um, so let's turn now to Professor 
Naganawa, and he is going to be talking about, um, well, Russia, the Soviet Union, and this and the Arabian Peninsula, I guess. Well, yes. please. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. And uh, I also am very much grateful for this opportunity uh, provided by the Edge Center. It's a really great honor to uh, show my uh, research here. And I, I first of all, I, um, of course, I'll, I'm going to talk about my, uh, the Russian unlikely alliance with uh, Saudi Arabia. And because I'm not an energy specialist, so uh, my focus will be on Islam and geopolitics of anti Westernism. Yeah. But, uh, but first of all, I would like to uh, react to your provocative um, Professor Colton's uh, a challenge. Why, why from the East? Why from the East? And Japan is also located in, in Asia and the East. But, uh, but Japan, Japan is, uh, uh, of course, the uh, Ukrainian war showed that Japan also uh, joined this uh, collective West in uh, organizing the um, uh, sanctions. And of course, uh, uh, Japanese Japanese are very uh, uh, proud of being the only Asians in the in G seven members G seven members. But and 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 by and thereby thereby Japanese tend to see Russia and the Middle East as at the Orient. Russia also the Orient. The Middle East also the kind. Middle East, of course, the typical Orient. So the Orient is uh, what we know. And uh, and by uh, what do you what do I mean by Orient here? And this kind of a, a, a opposite image: the West is a prosperity, peace, and democracy, and the East and the Orient is a poverty, war, violence, and, and dictator, dictatorship. And and the Japanese, um, uh, particularly in this uh, uh, war, war conditions, Japanese tend to uh, accentuate uh, this uh, dichotomy. And to see Russia as the uh, as the, as the evil kind of power in, in the world order, and uh, but uh, but we should see uh, this uh, Ukrainian war uh, in the in the in the more continuum of crisis. To use the famous phrase from the uh, Peter Hawke's book, continuum crisis. Uh, you know, we know the Syrian war, Afghan Afghan disaster, and in the ongoing Ukrainian war. So, uh, so, th so this uh, continuum crisis is emanating from the kind of uh, entanglements of the, of the two Orients, from the uh, entanglements between the Russia and the Middle East. So, so that's why uh, uh, Japanese, uh, uh, I, I believe that Japanese uh, uh, have a, a very good position to see this ambiguity. Japan uh, belongs to both, both, the, uh, both the East and the West. So, uh, I think uh, Japanese uh, should study this uh, entanglements. Uh, what they, what is happening from the the other side, the other side of our perceptions. So, uh, so so that's why uh, I think I believe that the uh, this uh, Russia Saudi relationship is a kind of part of this uh, larger kind of picture of the uh, uh, dichotomy that now working on in the, in uh, in the world. And the next slide, please. And my talk will begin with uh, Putin's uh, dialogue with uh, King, King uh, Saudi King Abdullah uh, in February in, in, uh, on February 11, 2007. Uh, President Putin uh, landed at King Hald Airport in Saudi Arabia. Uh, this was the first visit of the head of the Russian state to the kingdom. The timing was crucial. The day before his visit to Riyadh. Putin gave a famous speech in Munich, Germany, denouncing the U.S. unipolar world order and the NATO's progression to Russia's border against the backdrop of the color revolution in, in Georgia, Ukraine, and Kyrgyzstan. Implicit in this timing is that Putin's visit to Saudi Arabia was part of Russia's larger endeavor to establish another pole in global politics. While the U.S. devastated Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and Syria through humanitarian interventions, Russia continued to cultivate firm bilateral relationship with countries in the Middle East. As a result, Russia today seems to have no enemies in the region, mediating conflicts over Syria and maintaining good relations with both Iran and Saudi Arabia without raising much tension between the two regional powers. 
Russian commentators usually see this situation as Russia's return to the region after the failed Soviet engagement, engagement during the Cold War. Uh, next, please. Uh, in fact, Russia's Soviet relations also began with the Bolsheviks embrace uh, when the Bolsheviks em embraced the vision of setting Soviet Russia as the emancipator of the East against, against British imperialism. As a matter of fact, in February 1926, the Soviet Union became the first country that recognized the founder of Saudi Arabia, uh, Abdulaziz uh, ibn Saud. And, and by the end of 1925, Saudi Arabia had defeated the ruler of Mecca, Hussein al Hashimi, a former ally of Thomas Edward Lawrence. So this means that the Soviet had their own Lawrence of Arabia. His name was Karim Hakimov, a Tatar originally, originally from Bashkiria. Reader William Blood, British consul in Jeddah, the entrance to Mecca, uh, apparently saw a parallel between Lawrence and Hakimov. The British consul reported in May 1925. Quote, Hakimu tried to enlist Ibn Saud in the Soviet Union scheme for great revolt of the East against the imperialistic and colonizing powers, unquote. Here, I would like to emphasize that history does matter in contrast to the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the, and the US, which emerged as a marriage of convenience based on oil after the meeting of uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Ibn Saud on the Suez Canal in 1945. In addition, history reveals uh, persistent patterns in interactions between Russia and Saudi Arabia, which means relevant even today. And uh, actually, I, I, I interviewed one, uh, one of the uh, Russian diplomats working, uh, working at the uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. And actually, I, I said uh, Russian, but he's uh, actually from uh, Bashkiria, but he's uh, by, uh, nas by nationality Bashkir, uh, from Bashkiria. Uh, so, so this means that the, uh, uh, this is the same uh, ho homeland as, as, as from the, the first ambassador to the Saudi Arabia. And, 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 and he, testifies, uh, he testifies that uh, the, uh, the Saudis always emotionally uh, uh, meet uh, with the Russians, because, uh, and, and particularly the Muslim representatives, uh, Muslim representatives from Russia. And, um, and they kind of a really, uh, they Saudis do have a kind of really emotional kind of a, a attachment to to Russia. So, so I think that this, uh, this also uh, uh, we don't uh, we don't dismiss this. Uh, I think we should not dismiss this uh, emotional factors too. Um, uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. As Alan Kane, as Alan Kane in her influential book on Russia Hajj, fourth place shows a significant feature of Russia's involvement in the Middle East is an intimate linkage of imperial, imperial integration of Russian, Russian Muslim subjects and expansion to Muslim neighbors abroad. So the domestic policy and, 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 and the foreign policy are quite uh, related to each other, connected to each other. Here we can observe a similar dynamism. Uh, First of all, the Soviet representatives to Jeddah were Muslim Bolsheviks who had been deeply involved in party politics in Turkestan. The first Soviet representative to, uh, uh, to Hijaz was, of course, the uh, Karim Hakimov. Uh, he had actually occupied a uh, high, high party position, high party position in Tashkent, Bukhara. The second representative, as you see, uh, the Nazi Trakurov, he's a Kazakh, he's a Kazakh. Um, who uh, used to work in Tashkent together with uh, together with Hakimov for the Communist Party of of, of, of Turkestan. So this means that the uh, this uh, already they had a common practice in the Central Asia, and they their life path closed in in the Arabian Peninsula too. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the the Soviet um, uh, just like ju just as the uh, uh, their Tsarist counterparts, Soviet diplomats also attach a sub substantial importance to the Hajj, listening to the grievances of the pilgrims and those former Russian subjects living in the Hijaz. By doing so, the Bolsheviks try to expand their message of anti imperialism For the young Saudi state too, the Hajj was important not only as a political leverage with which to demonstrate Ibn Saud as the new protector of the Mecca, but also, uh, Hajj was the one of the important resource, one of the source of revenue for uh, for the Saudis before the discovery of oil in 1938. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, so this shield, uh, the, the shield uh, interest between uh, between the Soviets and Saudis uh, clearly embodied by the Congress of the Muslim World, which the Saudis assembled in, in Mecca in, in June 1926. By inviting, by inviting Soviet delegates to the Congress, Ibn Saud established himself as a new protector of Mecca and Medina, and thereby Saudis uh, amplify the British paranoia of global Muslim unity in collusion with the Bolsheviks. The Soviet Union, in its turn, dispatched a delegation with eight distinguished Islamic scholars. This was the second largest delegation after that of India. Here, we should note that the, the year of 1926 was the largest, the last moment, last moment for anti-imperialism to make possible a symbiosis of the uh, atheist regime. Uh, domestic Islamic authorities and the Wahhabis in Arabia. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to the Hajj, uh, Soviet diplomats were enthusiastic about expanding Soviet commercial presence in the Red Sea. The major exports from the Soviet Union were kerosene, benzene, flour, sugar, matches, timber, and man manufactured goods. Meanwhile, Ibn Saud behaved carefully so as not to irritate the British too much because his country neighbored the British mandate territories and, and, and its economy substantially dependent on merchants from British India. In the course of negotiations with the Soviets, the Saudis pressed the, for impossible, impossible conditions, the increase of pilgrims and the constant flow of profits to Mecca and Medina generated by the pious endowments in the former territory of the Russian Empire. Simultaneously, the Saudis attached uh, the, the, uh, the Saudis attempted to obtain long-term credit from the Soviet Union, and at the same time, the Saudis uh, tried to gain compensation from the British for the loss caused by the prohibitive measures against the Soviet products. So in short, Ibn Saud artfully played the Soviets off against the British to maximize, uh, to maximize their own profits. And this pattern is clearly visible today, uh, particularly in the relationship among the US Russia and Saudi. So, uh, so, so that's why the history uh, does matter here. Uh, next, next slide, please. And 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 the Soviet-Saudi relations, Soviet-Saudi relations stopped in 1938. And of course, the uh, um, uh, these uh, Hakimov and Shrakudov also were all, all executed. They're uh, shot. But during the Cold War. During the Cold War, the Soviets Soviet sent almost annually 20 to 25 pilgrims to Mecca and used these delegations as a showcase for freedom of conscience and reconciliation of progress and piety. Uh, next slide, please. The year of 1979, the year of, uh, sorry, 79, 1979 was the turning point with the, with the Islamic revolution in, in Iran and the Soviet invasion to Afghanistan. Competing with, competing with Iran for supremacy in the Muslim world, Saudi Arabia sent out to Afghanistan the Mujahideen's holy warriors, including Osama bin Laden. These figures, uh, these uh, fighters, consequently devastated the Soviet Union as a champion of uh, anti-imperialism. But the Saudis, uh, but the Saudis did, not, did not stop with this uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and they, uh, when the when the uh, uh, diplomatic relations uh, uh, began to start again in, in 19, uh, 1990, the, the one year before one year before the collapse, a number of, number of Saudi charitable organizations uh, penetrated into Russia the Muslim regions to, inv in, to invigorate the Islamic revival and even these uh, Saudi uh, funds uh, uh, supported uh, Islamic militants. Uh, particularly in Chechnya and North Caucasus. So Russia's security organs, as well as the Islamic leaders, denounced Islamic radicalism as Wahhabis, as, a, as opposed to traditional Islam kept by the Russian citizens. Meanwhile, the Saudis denounced Russia as an inhumane aggressor to the Chechen people. The 9-11 the convinced the US of Saudi Arabia becoming a major sponsor of global Islamic radicalism. So instead of Saudi Arabia, the U.S. tried to convert Saddam Hussein's Iraq into a secular democratic ally in the Middle East. We know this ended uh, with complete disaster. Uh, next, class. next slide, please. 
So Russia was against the war in Iraq. And at that time, he, uh, 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 Putin himself expressed, uh, expressed its solidarity, its solidarity with the Muslim world with the help of domestic Muslim leaders. Tadga Tajuddin, leader of the uh, leader of the uh, um, uh, Islamic uh, kind of she's uh, Islamic authorities in, in Russia, and he even declared jihad against the United States of America. And, and in the Iraqi war paved the and, and the Iraqi war paved the way for rapprochement between uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia. The the Saudis uh, Saudis active support enabled Russia to become the observer of the Organization of Islamic uh, co uh, Cooperation in uh, 2005. So, so the organization, organization of uh, Islamic uh, co co Conference, uh, Islamic co Cooperation, this is the kind of UN, UN of Islamic, uh, Islamic countries. So, so, uh, so Russia joined this organization as a kind of Muslim country. Muslim country. And the Saudis, meanwhile, were interested in avoiding they they also interested in avoiding too much too much dependence on the U.S. Inviting Russia's involvement in peaceful nuclear energy and military technology. And next slide, please. And Putin's visit uh, Putin's visit to Riyadh in two thousand seven was a very significant moment when the two largest energy providers in the world attempted to convert rapprochement into strategic cooperation. But here again. Saudis have behaved fearfully, so it's not the United Americans too much. So, so Riyadh never fulfilled promises of huge investments in the Russian economy, for example. So, so they talk much about the uh, you know nuclear uh, nuclear uh, power and and, uh, and 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 of course the Saudi Arabia is uh, very interested in buying the Russian weapons, but they talk much, but 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 few, very few, really realized, materialized. And Putin's visit, and Putin's visit was uh, returned after ten years, uh, when King Salman, another son, another son of Ibn Saud, visited Moscow in October uh, 2017. This happened in a different geopolitical reality after the annexation of Crimea and Russia's military intervention in Syria. And King Salman met Russia's Islamic leaders, including Crimean Mufti uh, Emir uh, Ali Ablaev. And they exchange ideas concerning the uh, countermeasures against religious uh, extremism. Uh, next slide, please. And the Hajj, and the Hajj remains an important occasion, uh, reinforcing both the both the integration of the Muslim citizens and the friendship with Saudi Arabia. Since Saudi Arabia annually allocates uh, a quarter of pilgrims to each Muslim country, uh, so this means that every Muslim, every Muslim cannot go. To uh, to make that freely, so you know the, the Saudis uh, uh, give a, 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 um, allocate the uh, seats to each Muslim country. So this seats uh, 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 sounds like a, a thousand a thousand pilgrims per million Muslims. So Russia has a quota. Russia had a quota of uh, twenty five thousand at maximum before COVID nineteen. Right. So Russia every year sent its special mission to Saudi Arabia to coordinate logistical details of, of the Hajj. So, so, so the Hajj is a very good occasion. So, so every year, Russia and Saudi have, you know, and have an occasion to discuss, something, something discussed, to be discussed. And uh, in addition, in addition, after the annexation, after the annexation premier in, in 2014, Saudi Arabia agreed with Russia to transfer the Hajj quarter, Hajj quarter of Crimean Tatars from Ukraine to Russia. Mm -hmm. So this means that, so this means that uh, Saudi Arabia indirectly, indirectly recognizes this annexation of Crimea. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, 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 Saudi Arabia technically agreed to uh, transfer the Hajj quarter to Russia. Um, in, in all spheres, all, all, in all spheres of the Hajj enterprise, Muslim representatives continue to play a pivotal role, and about which I actually published an article in the journal uh, Religion, State, and Society in to, uh, 2019, based on my field, field research in Tatarstan, Dagestan, and annexed Crimea. And next slide, please. And just briefly, and of course, the heads of the heads of the Muslim republics also use the Hajj to reinforce their image as the pious and benevolent, benevolent uh, kind of leaders before their uh, Muslim citizens. 
So as you see, uh, you know, the uh, this is a uh, head of the head of the uh, uh, Tatarsan, Tatarsan, uh, Rusta Minihano. As you see, uh, you know, the uh, this always the kind of religion is a kind of very good occasion to to visit uh, to visit Saudi Arabia. And uh, as you see, the, uh, the on the one hand, the uh, uh, Rustam Minihano is a kind of a, where uh, religious attire to to participate in the performance uh, religious performance. On the other hand, she she switched the business suit and, and, and negotiated with the Saudis. So this is the way uh, uh, Russians are doing. Uh, to conclude, uh, next slide, please. To conclude. I, I want to note that Putin's Russia identifies the Arab Spring and its disastrous aftermath with its own humili humiliating trajectory of the demise of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia, series of color revolutions, and Georgian war and the Ukrainian crisis. Putin's Russia was retaliating for the past, past humiliations, claiming the Crimea and returning to the Middle East by means of the Sy Syrian war. By doing so, the, uh, Russia has tried to make Russia great again on the international uh, arena. And Ukrainian war this year reveals elusive but, but increasingly strong alliance between the two oil giants in controlling energy, energy price in the global market. In addition, Mohammed bin Salman's personal involvement in, in prisoner, prisoner of war swap, uh, along with Turkey at the end of September suggests that Saudi Arabia is trying to be a significant player of uh, international politics using the Ukrainian war. And more broadly, more broadly say that regional powers such as Turkey, Iran, and Saudi Arabia are now moving beyond the region, moving beyond the Middle East by using the uh, Ukrainian war against the backdrop of the US withdrawal of commitment to the, uh, the Middle East. And, and of course, the, in, in the Middle East, the, the crisis was, has been enough. The uh, Palestinian crisis uh, and, and Middle Eastern uh, uh, regional powers uh, were very much uh, busy in bargaining with the US and the, and the uh, US and the Soviet Union. And, and of course, the uh, collapse of the uh, Soviet Union, they are busy with uh, 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 negotiating with, uh, with the US to build uh, their own, uh, to reinforce uh, their own quite busy in, in creating their own nation, nation building projects. But now it, it seems like uh, 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 they are more, began to be more interested in the more global international things beyond the regions, I guess the backdrop of the withdrawal, uh, a weakening, weakening uh, commitment, uh, the, US new, uh, the US weakening uh, uh, commitment to the, uh, uh, to the Middle East. Of course, I should add that Russia has a few, few economic and military resources to provide Saudi Arabia in comparison with the, with the US as Saudi's strategic partner. But now Russia and Saudi Arabia share a lot to be discussed besides oil, relationship with Iran and civil wars in, in Syria, Libya, and Yemen. And they were, and they were now talking about uh, the war in Ukraine. This September, Saudi Arabia received a partnership for dialogue in Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Mohammed bin Salman told Vladimir Putin that the kingdom was ready to be an active participant in SCO's activity. And the same, at the same time, Iran also received full, full membership of uh, SCO. So just as the Soviet-Saudi relations began as alliance against British imperialism, the, the, the Russian-Saudi relations today also works as a compelling challenge to the uh, Western-centric world order. So thank you for your attention. Okay, terrific. Thank you. That was really fascinating. Um, it's, it is intriguing how these spatial, um, uh, you know, terms are, have been used, well, in different respects over the years, and they're, they're very much uh, under challenge now. So you pointed out that Japan is uh, part of the collective West, just in terms of its political system and its orientation to uh, markets and so forth but it's also physically in the East. But the third category where Japan fits in terms of contemporary parlance, of course, is it's part of the global North as well, right? Um, and I think the Russians have been uh, at the highest level, been very slow to figure this out. So I'll just give you one example. Uh, David's gonna talk about this Valdai conference. And I've been to most of these. I was not invited this year and it would not have gone anyway, but I, I was there last year and I, I think I almost everyone. And one of the recent ones uh, I asked, the, the Russians define the agenda for this meeting as the rise of the East or something to, words to that effect, East or Vostok. 
And so Putin arrives and gives his little spiel and then uh, he, he takes questions. And, and, and I said, so why are you people still talking so much about West and East, East when a lot of the rest of the world is talking about North and South? He had, he had no idea what I was talking about. He was up and mystified and, and fumbled and just dropped the whole thing. Now, I think it, this has started to change because, uh, you know, the Kremlin is now is using the North-South stuff. So we're part of the Global South, uh, allied against the Global North. But they're also, it seems, reaching sometimes for categories that are not spatial. So the new one that I hear, I don't know whether you pick this up, David, is uh, the Global Majority. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, so it, that includes, I guess, a lot of the Global South but parts maybe of the East and it combined to this, their notion of a global majority. Um, so that's more common than a question, but I think, you know, this, this stuff is absolutely fascinating. Um, and uh, I mean, there is the little matter, of course, of 1938 to 1990, <laughs> there's a bit of a gap there, but, <laughs> sure. but that's okay. I mean, history can matter even when it has gaps uh, because I, I think we've shown that there's, there is quite a bit of continuity here uh, at, a, a, at a foundational level. And this is certainly news to most of us, I think. I hope you get more of this stuff published as soon as possible. Thanks so much. Uh, it's really excellent. So does anybody have a comment or a question? Yes, please. Oh, yeah, so my question, I'll uh, pray talk. Uh, my question is, um, uh, how do you see like uh, China's involvement in the Middle East today? Because like so with the Shanghai Cooperation Commission talked about, um, there's this perception that like countries like Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, right? All these countries like are like choosing China over Russia now, and of course like with Saudi Arabia. Um, would you conclude that Saudi Arabia is more aligned with China today, um, as like a you know, not just as an export place, but like um, they're trying to slow by ties with the you know the Chinese as opposed to um, you know the weakening influence of Russia because of the Ukraine war. So I'm just curious like to hear um, not just with uh, Saudi Arabia, but also like countries like you know UAE, Qatar, right? Like you know. Where would you okay, okay. I think we got the question. Thank you. That's good. It's a very good question. Okay, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's a, uh, indeed a wonderful question. And uh, well, I, I, I want to uh, uh, answer to this uh, question in two, from two sides. And uh, one, uh, first of all, um, the, the uh, where is SCO is going now? I think it's a kind of tradition. SCO is uh, originally uh, uh, it's a um, kind of an organization for uh, border control, kind of a, uh, if, uh, ex exchanging information about the terror. Terror met, uh, measures against terror, but but SEO increasingly now uh, um, uh, include in these uh, kind of anti-Western kind of uh, countries, and I think that uh, in that sense, the SEO is now in transition, now in transition. Where where is going now? So so I think in that sense also uh, um, uh, Russia and more in in more more the case the China. What does China want to do with uh, SEO? Perhaps the, uh, David also jumped in this talk, uh, perhaps in the, in the course of his talk. And, uh, and secondly, uh, um, as I said, Russia has uh, now increasingly fewer, less and less now, now resources to, uh, to interact with, the, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and the, and the Middle East and Gulf countries in general. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, of course, of course, uh, of course, America. Uh, of course, uh, as I said, that the when when the when these countries are unhappy with uh, the relations with the U.S. and they uh, so uh, so this country could could switch, uh, hedge to the uh, to 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 the Russia to uh, to gain more from the U.S. So I think that the Ukrainian war uh, partially uh, destroyed this kind of pattern. I think that Russia, uh, of course, the Russian weapon was a sales point, but the Ukrainian war showed that the uh, Russian weapon did not work so so very well. So the the appealing point is also uh, being lost. So I think that in that case, the uh, China could really could uh, be involved in this uh, bargaining process, and, and the instead instead of Russia. So so this is my so this is my speculation. Thank you. It's tricky though because China doesn't want Russia to go under. Right. I mean, yes, there, there's some rivalry there naturally, but China, at least under its current leadership, seems to really uh, be wedded to the idea that Russia will remain a great power, friendly to them. They're better off. Uh, well, that is to say, they can outmaneuver China, but not uh, Russia, but not go so far as to make its stability in question or something like that. Would you agree? Yeah. 
There are limits to how far they can go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dependent grain power. Well, so, <laughs> right, something like that. Yeah. Sydney, you had a question. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. And I have a question that is basically informed by both presentations. Is uh, uh, Russia potentially losing Western Europe as a market, oil and gas? What impact might that have on the Russian relations with Saudis? And again, maybe treat this question also as an invitation maybe to go into the 70s and 80s and OPEC politics, whether, whether they can inform any, any view into the future. So, are the Russia and Saudis emerge as potentially as allies dividing the markets or there would be a competition? What should we expect? What do you think? I'll start with you and then we'll go to the economy. Perhaps uh, it's uh, more, more about the energy, so perhaps I'll put it down then. Yeah, no, maybe uh, yeah, okay. you, you equilibrium, equilibrium, equilibrium will be, not the, that means uh, the, Oil from Middle East uh, goes to the West, and Russia Russia's oil uh, goes to the uh, North Africa, Asia, China, and so on. That uh, that uh, that will be maybe five or ten years. There there will be new equity. Yeah. I I understand. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to add that the uh, still the uh, OPEC plus is working well. I, I think that they just showed that uh, uh, recent um, kind of pro pro uh, oil production and of course, the, uh, uh, which betrayed the uh, US uh, expectation. And, uh, <laughs> and, 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 how, how, and, and this is how they are working uh, together. And, and of course, OPEC, OPEC plus, is, uh, uh, they respect the consensus among themselves. And of course, they are uh, against the backdrop of this uh, de de uh, decarbonization global uh, decarbonization. Of course, they want to sell, they want to sell the oil in a cheap price anymore, I think. I did. And, uh, and, and, and one thing I, I, should, uh, I should add that is, uh, this high price, uh, oil, uh, high price of oil is uh, also good to Iran. And, uh, and Russia also worked, worked with both Saudis and Iran. So, so uh, what what the what the Russians are doing? What the Russians are doing uh, with Saudis? Uh, Putin uh, constantly informed uh, Mohammed bin Salman what what we are doing with with, uh, with Saudis. And of course, that's, I, I think the same thing is true is uh, uh, when when they are talking with the Iranians, how 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 they are working with the Saudis. So so this is a kind of a, uh, 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 Russians are really uh, uh, try to uh, balance. Try to stick to the bilateral relationship, but but on the uh, uh, the other uh, at the same time they're quite balanced. Not not increasing tension between the two regional powers in, in the Middle East. And I'd like to add the another another supplier of oil and gas is the United States. United States is the largest producer of oil and gas, so there will be a, some competition uh, or some some uh, yeah, division of yeah supplier. Yeah. I think these are maybe three or. Yeah. Okay. But the Saudi is potentially replacing Russia when it comes to the European markets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it is intriguing that, that, that you know, the impression that you gave in particular is of a Russia which is quite nimble and uh, sophisticated and it balances, it hedges, it uses history when it, it serves its interest. But this, these are the same people who barged into Ukraine for absolutely no good reason on February 24th. It almost sounds like it's a different, two different countries. So that's why it's this- Smart uh, Russia, stupid Russia. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why that, that, uh, that, uh, that diplomat from, uh, uh, from Bashkiria, with whom I, uh, I took an interview, he quit, he quit the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. <laughs> so yeah, it was stupid to work with them. Uh, Smart people. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> They're all in Europe on right now. <laughs> okay, very good. So let's turn now to uh, uh, David Wolf, who is going to do a textual analysis and enlighten us about some of the foundations, I guess, of current Russian thinking and policy. So, sir. Um, thank you, Tim. Uh, th thank you. Thank you for having us here at the Davis Center. Uh, that, that was an excellent beginning to the discussion. So I'll try to leave some time for some more discussion. 
um, both the idea of bringing in both Russia and China and the Middle East, that, that goes back to a, 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 a Russian slogan of the early post-Soviet period, um, the idea of the uh, multipolar world. Sure. And maybe we're beginning to see that come together here. That was kind of Primakov's idea way back when. Um, but maybe we're really starting to see some flesh put on that 25 years later. Um, um, you mentioned the global majority. There was no mention of the global majority spe specifically that I saw in the, in the Valdai speech this time, but there was a reference to the global minority. There was the Zolotoy Milliard, the golden billion. Why should the world be all for the golden billion? But, you know, billion sounds like a pretty big number. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that was the reference I saw there. Um, so I, I want to speak today a little bit about um, some recent developments in Russia-China ties. Um, Russia and China have been um, most important others for each other for some 300 plus years now. Um, if I was to give you a list of dates that are historic firsts for China, no, 1689, 1727, 1860, 1917, 19, they're key dates when Russia and China do something for each other that's absolutely of global significance. Um, and I could come back to that, but I don't want to focus too much on history. But the leaders of those countries, Putin and Xi, are, are aware of how important over long periods of time um, the other has been for them. And um, therefore, we're in another period where possibly for Russia, no other country can help them out of the uh, situation they've been in as much as China can, although there's limits on what China can do here as well. And China potentially has much to gain from Russia as Russia weakens, if they can play it well. So I wanted to um, look at a recent discussion um, the Valda, of the Valdai discussion group. This is an annual meeting of a think tank close to Moscow, close to Putin. Um, it's a yearly conference from visitors from many walks of life in varied countries. Um, this year with sanctions and boycotts, uh, very few from the quote unquote unfriendly countries. So even Tim didn't get to go. Uh, I think Tim is probably the, the only one in the room who's been to Valdai. When we did this talk earlier this week in Washington, we had two. We had a, a Japanese member and we also had another American member, Harley Balzer, who had been there. Um, Every year, after several days of discussions of the experts, um, Putin comes to the conference and he answers questions from the audience. Uh, this year, it took place on October 27th. If I get something wrong about the mechanics of Valdai, please tell me later and I'll correct this. Um, Putin's usually pretty on the ball when he gets there. He's prepared for this. He seems to look forward to it. He's usually on message. It's a little bit of a marathon. He speaks for about three hours with all of the questions. Um, even longer sometimes. Yeah. And then shortly thereafter, it all goes up on the website. So it's all available and on the record. Um, you can tell me if stuff ever doesn't go up on the website. Maybe they, they edit. Well, you know, when it was first invented, there, there was no web uh, component at all. It was quite private and secret, but then that changed. Right. Um, so in this year's Valdai meeting with Putin, um, although this particular aspect was not covered in the Wall Street, in the, the Washington Post or the New York Times, nothing was more salient in the transcript than Sino-Russian relations, highlighting some important truths about the relationship and some likely falsehoods as well. Within minutes of taking the stage, Putin called out the West, whose divided, degraded nature he decried, for the stoking of, quote, the stoking of war in Ukraine, the provocations around Taiwan, and the destabilization of the global food and energy markets. So linking Ukraine and Taiwan, and this is kind of where we come in in Japan, because when we see what's happening from Japan in Ukraine, we immediately imagine what would happen if China did something like that with regard to Taiwan. It's, it's, um, it, it, it both the public and the, the policy elites in Japan think about this constantly, right? So when Putin links those two, he's actually doing the way we think in Japan. 
Um, so China would be mentioned again and again, more than any other country in the whole manuscript. Uh, and Xi Jinping took top billing being called a friend, not once, but twice. Chinese guests were called on twice for their questions. Otherwise only Russians got in more than one question. When asked by a Chinese professor for comments on the last years, the recent years of the Russia-China relationship, Putin treated it in greater detail than any other bilateral. And here are a few of the selected citations. We cooperate in all spheres, said Putin. China is our biggest trade and economic partner with trade and economic cooperation growing even before the sanctions. We are conducting regular military exercises. In military technology, we have enjoyed a level of trust previously unseen in the history of our two countries. And highest praise was reserved for the Chinese president, chairman, general secretary, Xi Jinping. My friend Xi Jinping and I, he has called me his friend and I consider him as such. When asked um, on a different topic about strategies for developing basic science in Russia, Putin turned it into compliments for Xi Jinping, talking about Xi Jinping's leadership of Chinese science, his leadership of the Chinese economy, and, and his improving of the well-being of the Chinese people. So absolutely fulsome. Nothing really new here. When I gave a talk in um, May, in, oh, when was it? When was I here? I was here in March 2020 um, at, the, at the, the Fairbanks Center. I also described the increasing levels of economic, military, and leadership level cooperation between Russia and China. And this was more of the same, but worse. Um, but there was also some new information to be teased from the transcript, specifically regarding the Putin Xi relationship. When Putin mocked French President Emmanuel Macron, who tried hard to prevent the war in Ukraine and then condemned Putin for it roundly, he told how Macron had violated the norms of top leader summitry by allowing their phone call to be heard on a speakerphone, a conversation that then became public. Putin said that making details from conversations public um, should only happen by agreement between the two leaders. In contrast, in 39 Putin Xi summits, the most either has held with a counterpart, there have been zero leaks, as far as I know, zero. I've never heard of a leak from these. So they, they maintain very good security about their conversations. Well, she berated the Prime Minister of Canada just a couple of days ago at G20 mm -hmm. for also um, making revelations about a private conversation. Oh, you should see it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I should look for that. Okay. Um, Putin then took a question from the session's moderator, Fyodor Lukyanov, asking if he had told Xi Jinping in advance of his plan to invade Ukraine. He referred to it as the, the military operation. Putin denied it and also denied that Xi Jinping had been upset at being blindsided, although they had met less than three weeks before Putin invaded. Um, before, before invaded, um, the Russian troops had already been fully mobilized and the Chinese president had been briefed on Russian readiness for war by American officials using the available satellite data, pleading in vain for Chinese intervention with his good friend Vladimir Putin to prevent the Ukraine event invasion. Indeed, it will be remembered that when Putin attended the 2022 Olympic opening ceremony in Beijing, just before the invasion of Ukraine, the Chinese Foreign Ministry press release on February 4, 2022 stated that the talks took place, quote, in a warm and friendly atmosphere, and that the two presidents had an in-depth exchange of views on the current international and regional situation and major hotspot issues of mutual interest. They concluded that the two sides need to engage in even closer cooperation and collaboration in international affairs. No direct mention of Ukraine was made in the Chinese foreign ministry statement, but certainly the main hotspot at that moment was Ukraine. And China would soon support Russia both economically and diplomatically with increased trade to cover losses due to Western sanctions, 
and by preventing UN action and Russian isolation by abstaining in key UN votes. So I doubt Putin's disclaimer that he did not say what he was going to do, at least at some level of detail. Interestingly, Putin's disclaimer is no less a revelation of the summit contents that according to Putin's own rules expressed regarding Macron would have had to have been cleared with Xi Jinping. But it is hard to imagine that coordination on the hotspot is not a more or less clear warning that military action would soon begin. And begin it did as soon as the Olympics ended, a coordination of timing that seems unlikely to be purely coincidental. Recent history suggests similar dissimula dissimulations. For example, Xi Jinping was <clears throat> present at the Sochi Olympics in 2014, three weeks before the occupation of Crimea and the Donbass areas. And the Chinese press statement at that time specifically said, they exchanged views on the situation in Ukraine, the Korean Peninsula and other issues. Ukraine first. Would she have really appreciated being blindsided on Putin's violation of his borders with Ukraine when China would be called upon to step up trade to counter sanctions and use its abstention at the UN to register support for Putin? This seems unlikely, and the two Olympic side meetings in 2014 and again in 2022 select collusion at the highest level, although we do not know what Putin actually revealed and in what detail. So Putin is helping Xi distance himself from events in Eastern Europe in accordance with a division of labor that could be implicit, but is more likely to have been explicit at some point at some level. Similarly, as Professor Tabata has pointed out, both China and Russia have stopped reporting many international trade statistics to hide the degree and kind of their trade from prying eyes. When they met, Xi and Putin, when they met most recently, the 39th visit in Samarkand on September 15th, there was much optimistic speculation in the Western press regarding disagreements, especially since China made no mention of Ukraine. But immediately on his return to Moscow, Putin escalated conflict by conducting a significant mobilization of additional Russian troops and annexing the four provinces he had more or less occupied. So one major takeaway from these summit analyses is that Putin is unlikely to make any new major move, either politically or militarily, without a next visit to Xi. Mm. So I'm glad it was a Xi Biden meeting in Bali and not a Xi Putin meeting. <laughs> of course, the mobilization, annexation, and missile attacks on the energy grid could be taken as a step towards the end game, as Putin may imagine it, but Putin's calculations have proven faulty several times already. Again, China abstained at the UN. Would Putin have taken these increasingly provocative actions if China had cautioned him in Samarkand? Does Putin not implicate China by taking significant military steps shortly after meetings with Xi? It is a kind of rhetorical entrapment hinting at China's shared responsibility for the sorrow of war visited directly on tens of millions and indirectly on billions. But Putin has hinted at deeper entrapments as well. For example, in June 2019, at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum, Putin described his position in the US-China trade war as, quote unquote, smart monkey watches the tigers fight in the valley. Would he not be content to see Xi Jinping join the battle? against the common enemy by retaking the renegade province filled with compatriots, or at least trying to retake the renegade province. It is not hard to imagine Xi Jinping might have gone in that direction had Putin romped to victory in Ukraine in a matter of days, as he may have imagined when he made that foolish decision. In his speech at Valdai, Putin was filled with indignation on China's behalf describing Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan as crazy, meant to antagonize China, even as the US is embroiled in conflict with Russia. He also called it a provocation, maybe hoping that China would feel provoked. In fact, convincing China to enter a conflict in East Asia 
could well deflect Western material support from Ukraine. Admiral Philip Davidson, uh, the commander of the Indo-Pacific uh, fleet, the American fleet, gave recent testimony to the American Congress, naming the next six years as the dangerous period for Taiwan, highlighting the possibility that China would try to annex it. Um, and um, that they might try to do that before a defensive weapons could be stockpiled in Taiwan um, so, that you, so that Taiwan could um, defend itself against a, a Chinese attack. The PRC is also aware of US self-doubts regarding US armed forces ability to conduct two major regional contingencies simultaneously, a core tenet of US military doctrine for the past 30 years. War in Taiwan would make Japan, with its many U.S. and joint bases, the rear, analogous to Poland for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. If U.S. forces became active, it would lead almost immediately to dispersal of American forces in Japan throughout the archipelago, <clears throat> making every airport, harbor, and railway hub of Japan into a Chinese missile target. In addition to rhetorical encouragement, are there ways in which Putin can encourage China down the slippery slope? Angela Stent has written of Putin's judo style of using other strengths against them. Might sales of certain weapon systems embolden China? The stockpiling of strategic reserves of raw materials, especially petroleum products from Russia, which is now going on, might be construed as a pre-war preparation but it also might be just one of the few ways in which China can aid Russia without drawing sanctions upon itself. But both Putin and Xi realized that their tenure at the helm of a great partnership and their resolve to end Western hegemony, as they call it, can only be sustained for the next 10 years or so while they remain capable of active rule. In his Valdai speech, Putin stated, we are at a historic crossroads we are in for probably the most dangerous, unpredictable, and at the same time, most important decade since the end of World War II. Exactly how fraught the decade will be depends in large part on how well China and Russia can manage their division of labor as challengers to the status quo. Thank you. All right, terrific. So I just wanna be clear on what your claim was. Uh, you used the word entrapment, which would suggest that Putin was drawing the Chinese in some to some extent against their will, but then you also seem to speak of them as co-conspirators. So what 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 was your your meaning? Well, the answer is it's either one or the other. Or either either they've actually agreed that they're going to play two separate roles where they're going to support each other, but China has to keep its economy going as best it can while. Russia's economy is going to suffer from what's going on right now, and that China is going to be the rear for Russia, or um, Putin, what I refer to, I refer to it as rhetorical entrapment, which is a little bit less, but it's still making use of the, the, the term from alliance theory. Um, rhetorical entrapment in the sense that after visiting with, with Xi, even if he says, I did not tell Xi that I was going to invade, and here I think it's the first time he specifically says, I did not tell him. But nonetheless, if he says, I did not tell him, but just a few weeks later, he does it. And then he does it again, where he says, I didn't tell him, but a few weeks later, he does it. Either he's blindsiding him, in which case, poof, Xi should be upset, but he's not. Um, or he's implying to everyone who's watching that, in fact, he had approval. A oh, nod, I see. Yeah, a I, green light. I got the second time around. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. that was unclear. No, no, uh, well, I'm in a bit of a fog as well, with jet lag, but you know, I see, that's really interesting. The, the thing with Trudeau, just the other yeah. day, was quite intriguing, mm -hmm. too. He, he accused Trudeau of leaking. Uh, they, they had a conversation about um, legal matters, I think, so it was something like that involving uh, the arrest of uh, an important Chinese person and uh, exchange of hostages and so forth. Mm. And uh, Trudeau blabbed to the media and she uh, did this to him on camera wow. and say that violates uh, you know, our, our common understanding of how 
statesmen talk to one another. So that being the case, and given what uh, Putin said about Macron, then uh, you would have to think that they would have had to clear such a thing. Right. Yeah. But then we have a little bit of that with the with the Biden Xi meeting as well, where Biden came away and, and said that there had been an agreement that there wouldn't be anything that they were both against any kind of nuclear anything. But then there was no mention of that on the Chinese side. Oh. So I, I, I guess if the statements don't match, that's not quite the same thing mm -hmm. as someone speaking out of turn. Yeah. Right. At at the leadership level. On the other hand, um, in terms of this kind of Kremlinology of the reading of the statements, it works out about the same. But the real question is whether or not he can actually, and, you know, if, if he had really taken Kiev in three days, which, you know, we saw that column heading for Kiev, that, that was certainly, how would Xi Jinping have reacted if Putin after that was saying, well, I've shown you what you do with renegade provinces. <laughs> It's not as hard as all that. Mm. Well, we have uh, about 10 minutes for if there are questions or comments for uh, yeah. any of our guests, but maybe we should start with Professor Wolf. Yeah. Uh, Professor Wolf, you mentioned that some of the traits that sits between Russia and China are uh, pretty much hidden, they've been discontinued. I mean, which specific economic statistics or uh, any type have been omitted and uh, how has that changed in the past couple months? I'm going to redirect your question to yeah. Professor. There was, a, about that. there was a brief discussion of that oh, before you come in, but that's okay. It's worth uh, underscoring. Right. Yeah. So because it's quite significant. Chinese economy. Uh, well, also the, Chi the Chinese statistics, also some of them were curtailed. Mm. Import and export. We've well, been yeah. getting some of them indirectly, directly from the Chinese. Yeah, but, uh, yeah China, uh, I think China uh, still uh, publishes statistics. Or uh, trade with Russia, but uh, I I noticed that uh, uh, natural gas, the quantity of uh, China, China's imports from Russia in quantity, uh, they ceased to publish from this uh, August or September, oh, this May or June. So I don't know the reason, but uh, I think. Uh, Except for this, China continued to publish mm. statistical data with Russia. I, I, I think so. I, I, I'm not a specialist on Chinese statistics, but as far as I know. But on Russia, Russian side, they ceased to publish uh, trade, trade data and uh, budget data. So it is very difficult to obtain such data. So if I did a Google search and tried to learn uh, how much oil Russia sold to China in October, I wouldn't be able to find that information. That, that is a, uh, uh, but the, uh, uh, oil, yeah, oil is, yeah, oil, uh, we can uh, obtain data. Oh, but yeah. gas is the Yeah, yeah, gas, yes. natural gas, yeah. yeah. From Russia, from, from, from Russia, Russia or? From, uh, not, not only from Russia, but uh, yeah, uh, in China's statistics, uh, natural gas, uh, imports of natural gas in quantity is not uh, available, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> only, maybe only total may be available, but by countries, I, I think it's not available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir, go ahead. Yeah. I'm curious about the battle you make about um, Russia attacking Ukraine and then Putin saying that China should perhaps consider attacking Taiwan. Um, attacking Taiwan, I'm, I'm from Normandy in France, and the landing was a miracle that it, it, it happened and, and, and the Allied port would win. But crossing the strait between China and Taiwan is much wider than from Great Britain to Normandy. Um, how could effectively um, Chinese forces be able to invade and occupy and have uh, and it took more than three years to prepare the um, attack in, in Normandy? 
is China ready to attack already? And well, I would just say this, this is a little per, a field from what we've been talking about here. I'm not sure that any of our, yeah. <laughs> of our panelists would be you know, in position to answer that. But I mean, there's a huge discussion of this in the American media. There's a big uh, article by, I think his name is Philkins in the current New Yorker on exactly this question. Mm -hmm. And he, I mean, his interpretation is there's a quite a good chance that the Chinese are going to give it a shot. And a lot of it is about how passive the Taiwan, Taiwanese are. But so, I mean, I think there's a lot of information out there, right? Now. Right, there's a, a lot out there. The, the real question is whether or not there's a perception in Beijing that time is running out. Mm -hmm. And with the, with the Americans having voted in the Congress to provide armament, not yet providing the funding for, not, you know, it's not a done done. And certainly with, um, depending on how elections proceed, nothing is a done done anymore in Washington. But basically the American side has said that it's going to try to make Taiwan into a porcupine. Yeah. After seeing the, exactly the types of weapon systems that are working for asymmetric warfare in Ukraine, it now becomes quite clear what you would need if you were going to try to make it maximally costly for the Chinese to come across the Taiwan Straits. And the funding, the approval in the Congress is to provide Taiwan with enough of that already in Taiwan, so that even if the Chinese use their missile capability to create a blockade around Taiwan, the, tai the Taiwanese would be empowered and have the wherewithal to withstand for a while. So they don't have those capabilities now, but in principle, they will have it in six to 10 years. Does that create a countdown? in a sense that this is the last chance to do this. And, and if Xi Jinping is going to, has decided that his legacy must be the complete unification of China, well then these 10 years when we expect him to be in power would be his only chance to do so. So this is, this is a lot of is it about perceptions here. Okay, thank you, Chris. My question is also a little bit off topic, but I think that, um, I'm wondering about popular perception about support for Ukraine and the war in Ukraine within Japan. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the government is part of sort of the Western alliance that's that's supporting um, Ukraine. In the U.S., there is fatigue. Um, more so, there's obviously a right-left split where the Republicans are now advocating that we don't need to be doing as much. And I would imagine that Republican and sort of MAGA Republicans are, are espousing the same ideas, but I'm wondering what the popular sentiment is amongst the Japanese people about um, support for the Ukrainians. Okay, great question. Who, who can answer? All. <laughs> who reads the <laughs> Japanese press? <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> Well, you're you're an observer from from outside, so perhaps you. Uh, well, how about you're the observer from the inside? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not so much uh, inside, but uh, uh, of course, um, the uh, I think the uh, in general, of course, the uh, Japanese uh, uh, public opinion are really uh, quite energetically support the uh, mm -hmm. Ukraine, and uh, and I, as I said, as I said, my my uh, reaction to the uh, Professor mm -hmm. Colton's. Uh, mm -hmm. Challenge uh, why why from the east mm -hmm. and and of course the uh, we are we are very proud of being a part of the west mm -hmm. so we are we are uh, we are supporting the uh, the western effort mm -hmm. against the against Russia so so that's why it's my our, our image of kind of orientalistic orientalistic image of, of Russia quite work very well too well mm -hmm. too well which I think could prevent us from understanding uh, what what the war is and what what's going on in practice? Or mm -hmm. I think I think this uh, kind of a more information history his, history or kind of a information kind of a really too much effort um, em, empathy and, and, and sympathy uh, sympathy with the, with the Ukraine could I I I am not afraid I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, uh, uh, and uh, so. And and uh, in that sense, uh, in that sense, uh, um, I think that uh, we do have a uh, inter intervention from the Middle Eastern studies mm -hmm. specialists, 
uh, to see the war in Ukraine as a kind of, kind of a proxy war. And mm -hmm. it's kind of a, from the, from the specialists of the Middle East, this very kind of a similar thing is happening. Uh, it seems like a kind of a civil war, of course, of course the Russian invaded that, but, but of course this, uh, 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 this uh, the Ukrainian war is simply a kind of a Russia's engagement, it's so many entanglements of the, the global politics. So, so I think that uh, in that sense, the Middle Eastern studies, uh, especially uh, in now uh, making a uh, quite kind of a different, different view. Uh, they are providing a different view of the Ukraine war. Yeah. Uh, if it's very brief. Yeah, brief. I just uh, want to ask Professor Wolf, like, what do you think is the likelihood that you know she might tax that food and like take uh, or try to invade them? Uh, like the stuff with that area because there's been some speculation that because Putin's weaker now, like you're asking yeah. whether China is going to invade the bottom of stock area or like I that would the answer because like they've had the four disputes in the past. So, um, so you know, one of the dates that I cited is 1860, and it is often forgotten that in the age of imperialism, when China developed its um feeling of being part of the global south and of being a, a, you know, that its historic task is to overcome colonialism. The only country that took a large chunk of land away from China and never gave it back was Russia. Uh, it's the size of two Californias or Germany and France put together, depending, you know, with what you like to compare with. So it's a pretty sizable piece of territory, it includes the, the Vladivostok and it includes uh, Russia's access to the Pacific, you know, pretty, pretty valuable piece of real estate. And um, so, of course, somewhere in, in on the back burner um, is this um, uncorrected piece of history. Um, on the other hand, I wouldn't say that that's anywhere in the immediate often for that. Um, certainly the fact that Putin is more dependent on Xi um, after weakening himself during the Ukraine war uh, offers opportunities for the Chinese. Um, on the other hand, it's not quite so clear exactly how they could take advantage of that. And I don't, I don't think that Putin's about to sign over that particular piece of real estate. All right, we've hit the, the witching hour here. Uh, so we've got a lot done in just 90 minutes. Uh, I, on behalf of everybody, I want to thank our Japanese colleagues for making the effort to come here and, and to share their work uh, um, with us. So yes, the topics were, were disparate, um, but um, the quality was high throughout, and I think we, we all learned a great deal from all three of you. So come again soon. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You, you did tie it all together. Yeah, we could do it.